We've all heard the stories. The spoilt couple. The tantrums. The split. But there are two sides to every story. It's an opportunity for us to understand why they did step down as senior royals and for us to understand what it is that they're searching for in life. When you have that level of independence, my goodness, you can do anything. Tonight, we hear Meghan and Harry's side. This book definitely is about getting the truth out there. This book has potential to have huge ramifications for their relationship with their other royals. What caused the rift? Look, we're, we're brothers. We're, we'll always be brothers. Um, we're certainly on different paths at the moment. I would imagine if there is any conversation that William could take back, it, it would be that one. And who is to blame? They felt it was a slight. They felt put out. No one in the royal family likes being taken by surprise. Was Harry really as unhappy as is claimed? Were Meghan and Kate really at war? Or did the couple simply demand too much? Kate and Meghan are not obligated to be best friends. There is an intense interest from the public to try and find out the unfettered truth. Meghan Markle made serious judgment calls and made considerable errors. Can the couple ever repair relations with the rest of the royals? I don't see them going back into the constraining embrace of the royal family. I think that they will fly free. And how kind will history be to Meghan and Harry? Yes, they were breaking free of the royal family. Yes, they were able to embark on a new chapter of their lives, but it came at a huge cost. Meghan and Harry. Everything seemed like a fairy tale when the royal family gained a new member. I think they had the potential to be this amazing, you know, celebrity couple. When they first got together, it felt like a real win, you know? I myself was like, this is amazing. I'm loving seeing this. The wedding's going to be beautiful. And that's when the chip, chip, chip away started. Since then, it's been a turbulent two years for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. And for many, they were to blame for everything that has gone wrong in the House of Windsor. But is that fair? I can just imagine what kind of struggle it was for them to see the constant lies, the constant made-up fabrication to sell papers, and that they were the human cost. Now, months after Megxit, we are witnessing the fight back. Harry! An explosive new book tells their side of the story, and it's causing breathless news coverage on both sides of the Atlantic. Now with the explosive new tell-all about the royal family. This morning, new revelations about Harry and Meghan's decision to step back as senior members of the royal family. And there could be some uh, pretty stressful conversations for the royal family following claims made by a new biography of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Finding Freedom charts the relationship of Harry and Meghan from their first meeting to stepping back as senior royals. Everyone wants to know if this book is Harry and Meghan setting the record straight. They and the authors say they weren't involved, but that hasn't stopped speculation. I think it's hard to believe that they didn't have more than a, an interest in it, certainly. There's certainly lines within the books, even quotes that have come potentially from Harry and Meghan, and I think that a lot of people will be thinking that they had more of a hand in it than they have been letting on. A royal will always deny any involvement because that's the convention. The convention is that you never, ever openly say that you have helped. But I think with Fighting Freedom, when we, when we read it, you, you can hear Harry and Meghan's voice. Finding Freedom is written by Carolyn Durand and Omid Scobie, two seasoned royal journalists. Another author, who has first-hand experience when it comes to setting the royal record straight, is Andrew Morton. His book, Diana, Her True Story, caused a sensation in 1992. He believes the objective of finding freedom is to set out Meghan's side of the story. This is basically trying to explain how Meghan approached the royal family and how she was uh, dismayed by 
the, the easy criticism of everything that she tried to do. She's been frustrated by the fact that she's not been able to give her side of the story, that all kinds of stories have come out about her and she's not been able to answer back. And it's something which she's found immensely frustrating. It's an opportunity for them both, and in particular Meghan, for us to understand why they did step down as senior royals, why they moved all the way across the pond, and for us to understand what it is that they're, that they're searching for in life. At the heart of the book is Harry and Meghan's decision to step down as senior royals. There are many reasons given, but crucially, we are told they were fed up being controlled by the royal institution. When they were told that they had to be brought within the confines of the Buckingham Palace machine, I think that's when they realised that their wings were being clipped and they weren't going to actually realise the stardom that they had set themselves up to be. The book claims there were concerns that the couple should be brought into the fold. Otherwise, the establishment feared their popularity might eclipse that of the royal family. I think they were particularly worried about William and Kate, that they might become more popular than them. And I think they just couldn't stand the idea of that. They couldn't stand the idea of this young, modern couple, half of which is African-American, potentially being more popular than William and Kate, who were their golden couple. Are we to read it that... Harry and Meghan felt that the other households thought they needed reining in, slapping down. Because that's how I read it. I read it that Harry and Meghan felt that there was this conspiracy against them and that they felt that they ought to be put back in their place on a variety of levels. And they became more and more insulin, more and more paranoid. And then they felt there was no option but to leave. It always reminds me of a top football manager saying that no one is bigger than the club. And I think that analogy is very, very uh, true here, that they weren't bigger than the institution. And certainly the, the, the men in grey suits that they believe were stalking the corridors, trying to clip their wings, might have been an invention in their own heads rather than actually what was going on. Those men in grey suits, as Princess Diana used to call them, were allegedly another element pushing Meghan and Harry away. In the book, friends of the couple call them vipers, and it's claimed some of them simply didn't like Meghan and would stop at nothing to make her life difficult. One of the suggestions in the book is that the courtiers or the vipers, as Harry and Meghan apparently refer to them, were out to get them, that they didn't like Meghan from the outset. It may very well be the case that there was a courtier, maybe two, who had it in for Meghan, who felt that she was too different, too confident, too ambitious, too different from anyone who had married into the royal family before. Meghan's differences led friends to call her Duchess Different, a play on the often repeated claims she was known as Duchess Difficult inside palace walls. I think calling Meghan Duchess Different is... It is very telling, and it shows the gap between the old ways and the new ways. We can appreciate the value in, in, that both represent and celebrate the difference rather than try to, you know, push it down or make it look like it's something bad. As Meghan and Harry's relationship with each other blossomed, their relationship with the palace and the rest of the royal family seems to have soured. The new book says, increasingly, Harry had grown frustrated that he and Meghan often took a back seat to other family members. And the pair had to wait to announce projects if other, more senior royals had announcements of their own. I think she found that very difficult because actually, what she thought she was getting was unrivaled power and she'd be able to help and effect this change and be this change maker, which is what she wanted to be. And actually, she found she was living in a gilded cage. By Christmas of 2019, Meghan and Harry had skipped Sandringham to take an extended break in Canada. They decided something had to change. And was that decision reinforced when they saw the Queen's Christmas message? Well, the lack of photograph of them appearing for the Queen's Christmas speech obviously had an effect on them and the book will tell you in detail about how this made them feel. They felt it was a slight, they felt put out. 
what I think was trying to be demonstrated during that Christmas message was the future of the monarchy, the future heirs, um, the future sovereigns. Harry and Harry's son are, are, are not there. They don't have that place on the table. From the $18 million estate they were staying at on Vancouver Island, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex set Megxit in motion. Emails were apparently sent to the Queen and Prince Charles. But the book claims Harry thought he was being blocked from a meeting with the monarch, which led to an extraordinary plan. One of the most fascinating and new revelations in the book was that when they landed in the UK from their sabbatical in Canada, they considered detouring straight to Sandringham to try and get a meeting with the Queen. If they had done that, I think the Queen would have been quite shocked and surprised, and, and because, frankly, that's not the way things are done. And I think that was, that's a lot of the problem here. Harry and Meghan didn't want to keep doing the way things are done. And the monarchy wasn't going to change things just for them. The monarchy's a super tanker. It just keeps on going, plowing its own furrow. Harry and Meghan wanted to become financially independent, split their time between the UK and North America, but crucially, still carry out duties for the Queen. Eventually, the Queen agreed to issue a joint statement about her grandson's plans. On the 7th of January, the Duke and Duchess attended an event at the Canadian High Commission. The book reveals they were feeling nervous. They'd seen the planned statement and thought it showed a lack of warmth. Uh, it's meant a lot to us and it's just important for us to start the year and we're going to say thank you. More concerning to them than that, reporters got wind of the plan to stay in Canada. A day later, the Sussexes made their shock Instagram announcement. A move that's been endlessly criticised, but it seems in their minds they felt they simply had no choice. It was very sad, really, that a couple who offered so much to the monarchy and to the nation had decided to go their own way. At the time in January, there was a lot of anger because as one very senior member of the household said to me, you don't put a gun to the Queen's head. You don't go public and say what you want. We sort it out behind closed doors, we all try and negotiate, and then we present a united front. As well as their announcement, Meghan and Harry simultaneously launched their Sussex Royal website. It's since been claimed this, and making an announcement without discussing it first, left the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh devastated. The issue of them creating this Sussex Royal brand and the Sussex Royal website was a huge, huge problem for the royal family because if they were going to go into the corporate world and start marketing themselves for big, big sums of cash, that was going to be the problem, that the Queen and senior royals couldn't have them marketing themselves as royal whilst earning money on their own personal terms. Crisis talks were needed and on the 13th of January, Harry met the Queen Charles and William at the famous Sandringham Summit. Yes, they were breaking free of the royal family. Yes, they were able to embark on a new chapter of their lives, but it, it came at a huge cost. Especially for Harry. He had to give up his military roles. Finding freedom gives an insight into Meghan's feelings. It was so unnecessary, Meghan later told a friend. And it's not just taking something away from him, it's also that entire military veteran community. You can see how much he means to them, too. So why? Harry has had to give up everything. He's giving up his family, his home, his country, everything he's ever known, and those military titles, which, and Meghan's right, they, kept, they meant so much to him. And what about what Meghan has had to give up? Finding Freedom claims Meghan told a friend I gave up my entire life for this family. I was willing to do whatever it takes, but here we are. It's very sad. Even so, it's said courtiers and some family blame Meghan for Megxit. This girl who fell in love with a boy who happened to be part of the royal family, and she gave up her whole career to move over here to, of course, 
uh, follow tradition and ritual marrying into the royal family, and she literally couldn't win. And she basically gave up a part of herself because that is what would have been expected of Meghan, expected of um, Kate, you know, the Duchess of Cambridge. And they all did that to, out of love for their spouses and out of respect for the institution. These new revelations tell a story of just how unhappy Harry and Meghan were with their royal life and how they felt forced into leaving. But the new book also gives us a new insight into Harry and William's relationship. William potentially saying to Harry, listen, take your time to get to know this girl. Don't be blindsided by lust. Don't rush into anything. I would imagine if there is any conversation that William probably could take back, it, it would be that one. To understand why the relationship between Harry and his family broke down, you have to go back to the summer of 2016. Rumours about Harry and Meghan's relationship were circulating, and Meghan soon had the world's press following her every move. By November, Harry had had enough and issued an extraordinary statement asking the press to leave his girlfriend alone. And Prince Harry lambasts the press for harassing his American girlfriend, Meghan Markle. The statement that Prince Harry released through his private office uh, in November came um, just after a, a deluge of, of, of media reports about their relationship. I mean, the statement was a bombshell, perhaps the first of, of what we were to expect from the Sussexes, in that it, it was certainly the most personal statement I, I've ever read from a, a senior member of the royal family. This was also confirmation that Meghan was his girlfriend. Don't forget, up until that point, it was only speculation. <laughs> It's now been claimed the statement caused tension in the family. Not because of its content, but because of its timing. It immediately took attention away from Charles and Camilla. They were on a diplomatic tour of the Middle East. Well, Harry's decision to write this statement himself and give the family only 20 minutes notice that he was putting it out was absolutely catastrophic. It torpedoed Prince Charles's tour of the Middle East, which went down like an absolute lead balloon in the palace. The royal family has strict protocols in place to ensure they don't overshadow each other's work. Something Harry appeared to overlook when he attempted to protect Meghan. I think one of the themes that is explored in Finding Freedom is, is the jealousies of some members of the royal household and some courtiers of the level of attention that the Sussexes were getting. You know, there was a point when Charles and Camilla weren't even getting a look in. You know, all the tabloids wanted to run was stories about Meghan and Harry, and that became a problem. And I think there's definitely some truth in the fact that Charles at times has felt a bit jealous, maybe, of his son's public profile because for a long time William and Harry were getting really really positive publicity and Charles of course had had dreadful publicity. <laughs> Harry's statement caused shockwaves in the palace and allegedly upset the Prince of Wales but looking back this wasn't the first time Harry had come out in vocal defence of his girlfriends. In 2005 whilst dating Chelsea Davy he gave a frank interview to mark his 21st birthday. I suppose that is the media in general. There's, there's truth and there's lies, and unfortunately I can't get the truth across because I don't have my own column in the paper, which I'm thinking about getting. It does irritate me because obviously I get to see how upset she gets, and I know, I know the real her. I don't think Harry's changed an awful lot over the years. He's become far more considered and far more aware of what's going on in the world. At the same time, his hostility to the mass media and to photographers and the paparazzi in particular hasn't changed one jot. So he was hostile to them before and is hostile to them now, um, to the point where he has, in his own mind, more control over his life. Less than a year after the statement, there was another incident, this time between Harry and William. Finding Freedom details a conversation that supposedly took place just before Harry proposed to Meghan. William is quoted as saying, don't feel you need to rush this. 
take as much time as you need to get to know this girl. A source claims William didn't want his brother to be blindsided by lust. The book goes on to say, Harry could see through William's words. He was being a snob. I think that there was a great misunderstanding in that moment. That was, I, I believe, intended from a genuinely good place, a place of brotherly love and just wanting Harry to be absolutely sure, given the speed that this relationship had moved at, that he wasn't rushing into things. Harry, who was clearly sensitive um, and I think aware of, of some of the sniping in the corridors of power about Meghan, just took this deeply personal and the wrong way. And I would imagine if there is any conversation that William probably could take back, it, it would be that one. I think William was just trying to say, trying to look out for his younger brother. Now, maybe it goes to the heart of their relationship and Harry was frankly fed up with playing third wheel, effectively, to, to William, Kate and Harry. I mean, sometimes when the three of them did jobs together, I'd, I'd go and watch them. And it, I did feel a bit sorry for Harry. You know, Kate and William were always first because... You know, in the line of succession, William's always first, and Harry was always slightly trailing behind. So did William ever really accept Meghan? Rumours of a rift refused to go away. During Christmas of 2018, William appeared to ignore Meghan outside church. The following Easter, another incident, on the Queen's 93rd birthday. The footage appeared to show the brothers avoiding each other. Is there petty jealousy? Yes, because I think there is between any family. Show me any family in the world where there's not jockeying for position or one sibling doesn't think, oh, you know, that's a sibling, shouldn't have that, or etc. That is family, that is the human condition. I do think this is War of the Wales's party, but this is also the British royal family. This is what they do. They argue, they fall out, and then we make a drama out of it. But for some, Harry and William's fallout is far more serious. This was a devastating blow to the British people and indeed members of the Commonwealth because they have looked to William and Harry as being the successors. So to see a divide between those really did tear at the very fabric of the British public's relationship with the royal family. From an early age, there was clearly a friendly rivalry between the brothers. Did you live together again? You know, much experience being the same? Well, bear in mind, I cook him and feed him basically every day. I think he's, uh, he's done rather well. He told us the other week that he did all the washing up. He does do a bit of the washing up, then he leaves most of it in the sink and then it comes back in the morning and I have to wash it up. Oh, the lies. <laughs> yeah, the I think the difference between William and Harry has a lot to do with succession in the royal family. William knows that at one day he will become king. Harry knew that the reality of that was very, very unlikely that he would ever sit on the throne. So in many ways, he lived a life free of those shackles. He was the rogue and renegade prince. And there was nothing wrong with that in Harry's eyes. And seemingly there was nothing wrong with that in the House of Windsor's eyes either, because it made him more relatable and it also modernised the monarchy. Tension between the brothers was confirmed by Harry himself during a bombshell interview with Tom Bradby. There's been a lot of talk in the press about rifts with your brother. How much of that is true? Look, we're, we're brothers, we're, we'll always be brothers. Um, we're certainly on different paths at the moment, but I will always be there for him and as I know, he'll always be there for me. Um, you know, we don't see each other as much as we as much as we used to, but you know, it's just as I said, as brothers, you know, you have good days, you have bad days. I think now that we have the book coming out and what we've read from Finding Freedom really does solidify what Harry was talking about in the Tom Bradbury interview when he said that there's good days and bad days. This book is telling us literally in black and white, or will tell us in black and white, what those good days and what those bad days were. Not only is it alleged that William wasn't as accepting of Meghan as Harry would have liked, it's also claimed she wasn't warmly welcomed within the palace. One senior royal referred to the American actress as Harry's showgirl. Another told an aide, she comes with a lot of baggage. 
and a high-ranking courtier was overheard telling a colleague, there's just something about her I don't trust. It is alleged that a senior member of the royal family referred to Meghan as Harry's showgirl. We, we don't know which senior member of the royal family this is. According to another source, a courtier um, said that she came with a lot of baggage. And to a degree, um, you know, Meghan did come with baggage. She wasn't the virgin bride marrying into the royal family. I think it was celebrated that she was from a dual heritage. She had a black mother, a white father. There was a great excitement about the fact that she was akin to a Hollywood movie star, not A-list, but still famous in her own right. Meghan was a senior royal for, you know, an incredibly short time. And I think if we look back at that short time, she was almost immediately uh, hounded by the British tabloid press. And there wasn't a, you know, there really wasn't, it's very hard to find a really kind article about Meghan that was rather ruthless, to be honest. Now, with thousands of miles separating Meghan from the palace and Harry from his brother, it remains to be seen if Harry and William's relationship can ever be the same again. I definitely think the dust needs to settle, and it may not happen next week or the next weekend or the one after that, but there's definitely a way back from this, and their relationship can be repaired. The irony about this book, in many ways, is that the brothers were just getting to a stage in their relationship where they were on a more even keel. I was told that communication had resumed between the brothers. We don't know whether they've spoken in light of, of the excerpts from this book, but one can only imagine that this has done nothing to improve relations um, uh, that were strained um, in, in the beginning and at this stage must seem pretty beyond repair. Finding Freedom not only claims to know what happened behind the scenes with Harry and William, but sheds a light on the rumours of duchesses at war. I think there was a lot of excitement that Kate and Meghan would have become best buddies. However, when you look at it on the face of it, they were very, very different women from very different backgrounds. They were already going to have very different roles with the institution. And I think the pictures of them laughing and joking at Wimbledon were probably the best it was ever going to get. Finding Freedom is said to be Harry and Meghan's side of the story. It claims to provide a new perspective to all the stories, rumours and gossip that we think we know. In particular, a focus on negativity surrounding Meghan's relationship with Kate, not long after she became the Duchess of Sussex. After the royal wedding, you know, once that sort of crest of the wave of excitement and euphoria had subsided, there was a slow drip of reports that, that began to show Meghan in, in a different light. After her wedding, Meghan was faced with a number of negative headlines. One in particular seems to have angered the Sussexes. It was reported that Meghan had made Kate cry during a bridesmaid fitting. Finding Freedom details the incident. Some of the children weren't cooperating and there was a lot going on. Everyone tried to help where they could, but it's never easy with kids at fittings. There were no tears from anyone. I also think that it proves that, yeah, that story was put out by anti-Megan people, by people who wanted to vilify Megan, and it actually unpicks that, and it also proves that we know that there's people actively out there working to make Megan look bad. There are always two sides to every story, but you know, Kate either cried at that dress fitting or she didn't, and you know, there are only a couple of people who know if that actually happened. It's interesting that that is one of the stories that is contested in Finding Freedom. What Finding Freedom doesn't do is actually explain what did happen. Whatever the truth, Meghan and Kate's relationship soon became a favorite topic for the tabloids. I think as soon as Meghan married into the royal family, the comparisons between Meghan and Kate were, were constant. And Kate is English. She's an English rose, and she, she does everything the right way. But she will be the future queen. I think there needs to be some leeway for Meghan and Harry because, you know, he's, he's now much further down the peg line as far as inheriting the crown. 
I think there was a lot of excitement that Kate and Meghan would have become best buddies. However, when you look at it on the face of it, they were very, very different women from very different backgrounds. They were already going to have very different roles with the institution. And I think them, the pictures of them laughing and joking at Wimbledon were probably the best it was ever going to get. Despite the press rumours the duchesses were at war, Finding Freedom claims the relationship between the sisters-in-law was less tense than reported. It does, however, reveal they struggled to move past the distant politeness of when they first met. It was very easy for us to escape into this storyline that Meghan and Catherine were best friends that William, Harry, Meghan and Catherine <laughs> represented <laughs> the Fab Four, this union mind. of young royals that were set to take control and modernise the monarchy. It wasn't the case at all. Just one year after they were photographed laughing together at Wimbledon, new photographs emerged of Kate and Meghan together at a polo event. This time, the atmosphere appeared a little less friendly. The book notes there was a cordial but distant rapport. So there was a big exclusive event in the summer of 2019 and both Kate and Meghan were there with their children. In fact, it was probably one of the first times we'd seen Meghan out and about with baby Archie. Uh, Kate was watching the children playing on the field while watching the polo. But the real striking thing was that the two women were not speaking. They weren't even conversing for most of the day. And I think that was quite a bit of a realisation for the British public and quite a disappointment as well that these two women were not going to be the best of friends. It's reported Meghan had wanted a strong and close relationship with her sister-in-law. The book details that Meghan had initially hoped that Kate would potentially reach out to her and help guide her as somebody who had married into the institution, but the offer never materialised. It goes on to say, Kate felt they didn't have much in common, other than the fact that they lived at Kensington Palace. So while there might have been an expectation from Meghan that Kate was going to sort of sit down and, and show her the ropes, perhaps that was an unrealistic expectation. Um, you know, the Duchess of Cambridge is, is a busy woman, um, but Meghan clearly took that quite personally. In the same weekend Finding Freedom dominated the papers, Emily Andrews broke the story that friends of the Cambridges say Kate rolled out the red carpet for Meghan. So who was to blame for this coldness? I think it seems that Meghan had a very unrealistic expectation of her relationship with Kate. I mean, if you look at it from the Cambridges' point of view, they don't know this woman at all. From their point of view, they absolutely did welcome her into the family. William and Kate invited Meghan um, and Harry to apartment 1A. Um, Kate met Meghan pretty early on in the relationship. And I think from William and Kate's point of view, they did try and help as much as possible. They, they, but they were at a very different stage of life. With friends of William and Kate refuting stories from Finding Freedom, the public is once again presented with two sides of the story. Unsure which side is telling the truth. By the time Harry and Meghan's final royal engagement came around in March of this year, the tension was clear for everyone to see. At the Commonwealth event, Meghan appeared to wave to Kate, but the gesture wasn't acknowledged. I was sitting behind William and Kate and Meghan and Harry a few rows back with, with other members of the press at that service, and there was absolutely a tension between the two couples. Um, while Kate turned around to speak to um, Edward and Sophie Wessex, she just didn't acknowledge Meghan and Harry at all. And um, that was very obvious. Finding Freedom notes that after flying straight back to Canada, Meghan, at that point, couldn't imagine wanting to set a foot back into anything royal again. There is no doubt that certain plot lines sell newspapers and sell magazines. And initially, what sold was the remarkable story of these four young royals and the tight union that they supposedly had. 
But in reality, that just wasn't the case. Finding Freedom has done nothing to quell the fascination with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Presenting another side of the story and asking if the criticism facing the Sussexes has been fair. The whole story about Meghan wanting, you know, the chapel for a wedding to smell a certain way and then people find out that Kate wanted the exact same thing, but Kate is not being crucified for that, however Meghan is. That just highlights again that this toxicity against Meghan is coming from a very deep place of bias. Finding Freedom might arguably tell the story from Harry and Meghan's side, but it's not the only book about them to hit the shelves this summer. It's the hot cakes right now. It's almost as though people think that this is the next version of The Crown from Netflix. I think that there is a battle at the moment amongst authors to try and tell or answer the unanswered questions as to what led to the split. It's a fine line of who knows what and who actually to be able to trust when all these books are coming out all at once. Many well-covered tales about the Sussexes feature in books by Lady Colin Campbell and journalists Dylan Howard and Andy Tillett. But are these just examples of yet more unfair criticism that Meghan has faced? Such as claims Meghan wanted St George's Chapel to smell a certain way for her wedding. A story she was ridiculed for in the press, despite Kate wanting the same thing at her wedding in Westminster Abbey. The whole story about Meghan wanting, you know, the chapel for her wedding to smell a certain way and then people find out that Kate wanted the exact same thing, but Kate is not being crucified for that, however Meghan is. That just highlights again that this toxicity against Meghan is coming from a very deep place of bias. Westminster Abbey is not the same thing as St. George's Chapel. I've actually been to events at both. And I have to tell you, St. George's Chapel does not smell musty. It smells of bees wax, which is what the furniture is waxed down with. Maybe Meghan had never smelt bees wax before in her life. Lady Colin Campbell's book addresses another infamous story. The claim Meghan clashed with the Queen over her choice of tiara for her wedding. But Finding Freedom says there was no clash. Each story has been corroborated by at least two sources, and they spoke to over a hundred sources for the book. People don't want to believe that. They want to think, only Harry and Meghan will say that, and they are lying. Instead, the book says it was Harry who had reservations that the Queen's dressmaker, Angela Kelly, was intentionally delaying the process of Meghan selecting her wedding day tiara. But it is quite one-sided. Yes, Harry and Meghan don't escape criticism in the book. That's certainly true. But it is mainly their side of the story and everyone else is the bad guys. Either way, what is sure is that there have been countless attacks on Meghan over the past two years. Allegedly, some even came from Palace Insiders. It seems to me that some of the stories are stemming directly from Buckingham Palace. And we're back to this narrative again, that strong, independent women are anathema in our society. Duchess Difficult, Hurricane Meghan, some of the headlines that started coming out in the tabloid press, reports that you know she had a habit of sending dawn emails to staff and wanted a response before lunchtime. This appears to be true and seems to be backed up in Finding Freedom. But the author's interpretation of this is that this was um, an experienced, successful American actress who was used to having an entourage of staff and who was used to having things done quickly. The idea that Megan's a diva is clearly one of these racialized ways of thinking about black women where, you know, they have this, there's this long-standing idea of the strong black woman who doesn't need anybody else, who's, you know, who's feisty and aggressive. 
Meghan has faced criticism for pretty much every move she has made, even down to the clothes she wears. When Meghan came on the scene and started wearing gowns that were thousands of dollars and living an extravagant lifestyle, then it began to rub people up the wrong way. Someone's got to spend the most, and Meghan's the one that spends the most. Again, it's just a non-issue, it's a non-story. She's probably spending her own money. What's the big deal? And even a claim that Kensington Palace staff noted that Meghan's charity cookbook, raising funds for the victims of the Grenfell tragedy, didn't contain a single recipe of British origin. She was trying to do something wonderful and good for all of those that were lost at Grenfell Tower and for their families. Everyone embraced this so deeply because it's been a passion project for all of us and for very good reason. For Meghan, much of the criticism must have felt unwarranted and unfair. Why is Meghan a target for criticism? Hmm, very good question. Right, I don't know. I, do you have a piece of paper? Several pieces of paper? But let's start with the fact that one, she's a progressive woman. She's independent. And let's talk about the fact that she doesn't fit your uh, traditional idea of, you know, royalty. Let's talk about the fact that she's a woman of biracial heritage, right? Let's talk about the fact that her profession was that of an actress and the fact that she's American. There's just so many things around and about her that many people do not like. I feel for the poor girl. I mean, she, she came into this country, parachuted in. She's married into a, a very difficult family that everybody finds difficult to come into because of the various pressures. And she's someone who didn't know an awful lot about British history, British culture. And she's, as she said herself, she's going to hit the ground running. And she hit the ground running, but she found that she came up against a brick wall. But amongst all of the petty criticism, there have also been stories that suggest Meghan and the royal way of life was a culture clash. In my book, I go to great lengths to explain how the culture clash arose. Because Meghan has very American attitudes and expectations. She is all about confidence, go-getting, hustling, and all of those Hollywood things that she has been brought up to regard as desirable. Did Meghan really know what she was letting herself in for when she married into the royal family? Some stories show how she struggled to get to grips with royal life, like her first official engagement with the Queen, opening the Mersey Gateway Bridge in June 2018. People haven't looked at the, at the real person who's trying to do her best coming into the royal family. Someone who didn't know the protocol, didn't know the etiquette. I'll give you a perfect example. She went up to Liverpool with the Queen and she's sitting on a stage, it's a windy day. She doesn't know what side of the car to get into, to get out of. what hand to hold her handbag in, and you can see that kind of confusion in her face. Meghan, even though she's an actress, has had to swap the, the red carpet for, you know, the, the, the Royal Roadshow. And it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult gig. There were certain elements of royalty that perhaps weren't for Meghan, but she was widely condemned regardless, like security, Dylan Howard's Royals at War reminds us of an incident in Fiji when Meghan visited a market. Every royal is assigned a level of protection when making uh, appearances in public. And there could be no more valuable commodity, if you like, than a pregnant Meghan Markle making appearances in public. Under sweltering temperatures and with an increasingly large crowd, the Duchess was rushed out and the visit ended early. Turn right, turn right, turn right. In 
inevitably in these types of scenarios, the royals are briefed about what is right and what is wrong and what is expected of them in order to maintain their security and their well-being. The security officer in charge quit her role not long after, amid claims at the time that Meghan found security constraining. Although the palace denied this was why she left. Meghan was oblivious. Despite being told how to behave, she thumbed her nose at the restrictions or recommendations of the Royal Protection Officer. And Lady Colin Campbell recalls at an event that, in her view, shows Meghan unwilling to persist with royal duty at her and Harry's first public engagement as a married couple. I was at a dinner party at a very, very famous aristocrat's house four nights after the wedding. And this person has impeccable court connections at a garden party to celebrate Prince Charles's 70th birthday and all of his charity connections. There had been this garden party at Buckingham Palace and Harry and Meghan were there. Good afternoon, everybody. And there was much excitement about them being there because, of course, at that time, they were the most popular couple in the country. Uh, She was a revered figure. People couldn't wait to meet her. Well, 15 minutes into the engagement, Meghan is overheard telling Harry she's bored and she wants to leave because they've effectively done their photo op. And the person who overheard this was completely gobsmacked. All of these stories and allegations hint at teething problems as Meghan grappled with royal life. But rather than focusing on arguably unfair criticisms, should the public and press have been more understanding of Meghan's struggle? (laughs) After all, it's something that is very different to what she was used to. In the face of it, everybody was very, very excited when Meghan came on the scene. She was hugely successful in her own right. She'd spoken on the world stage on big issues like the UN, human rights, girls' education. I think there was an awful lot of interest and excitement with her coming on the scene. But she definitely wanted to hit the ground running. She'd said that herself. And I think that in certain sections of the palace, that was quite difficult because there were certain processes, protocols that had to be followed. And when these two worlds collided, there was definitely a clash that couldn't be avoided. There was a culture clash. American divorcee, biracial actress, woman of substance, 21st century girl from Los Angeles, versus the pale, male, stale, and very white British monarchy. Yes, we have a woman as our head of state. Yes, we have a woman as our queen. But it is still an old fashioned institution. It's done in you know, tradition is all, duty is all. And that's not very woke or 21st century. Coming up, did Meghan feel she lost her ability to speak out when she became a royal? That age-old mantra, which has stood the royals in very good stead, never complain, never explain. I think most people would say that she absolutely didn't understand that. And now that she and Harry have left, is she getting her voice back? It's been very empowering and inspiring to see and to hear what they've had to say. Many observers believe that a key factor behind the Sussexes leaving the royal institution was what some saw as the muzzling of Meghan Markle. Before her marriage to Prince Harry, she'd used her media profile to highlight social issues close to her heart. Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice, they need to feel empowered to use it, and people need to be encouraged to listen. More people were encouraged to listen when her relationship with Harry became public. But being Harry's girlfriend was one thing, being his wife was quite another. 
if she was not part of the royal family, the way she would have come out to speak on issues and to lend support on different things. She had to curtail all of that. You can speak your mind as a celebrity. You can align yourself with different politicians um, as a celebrity. You can't do any of that as uh, being a member of the royal family. The blogs and all that stuff, that's just been silenced 100% to fit this role. Maybe one of the reasons for them wanting to leave is so that she can go back to doing it. And following her move to Los Angeles, despite the lockdown, Meghan Markle is out there speaking her mind once again. All of you are out there campaigning, fighting the right fight, being on the right side of history and ensuring that we can get closer to seeing this truly as our past and not something that we have to revisit again and again and again. Meghan and Harry have given, you know, recent Zoom virtual talks to many the, uh, from the younger generation. They've definitely been able to speak about matters that are at the heart of them and matters that are important to them, uh, like Black Lives Matter. The only wrong thing to say is to say nothing. Because George Floyd's life mattered and Breonna Taylor's life mattered and Philando Castile's life mattered and Tamir Rice's life mattered. And so did so many other people whose names we know and whose names we do not know. It's been very empowering and inspiring to see and to hear what they've had to say. But did Harry and Meghan really need to leave the Royal Institution to speak out on subjects like racism and women's rights? I went back to the palaces, various people in the palaces, and I said, would Meghan have been allowed to make those kinds of speeches if she's still working for the royals. Now, you can take what I'm about to say is, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? But literally, to a man and a woman, the people that I spoke to said, yeah, why not? More problematic for the royals, perhaps, was a concern that Meghan's progressive agenda might encroach into politics. You're going to use your voice in a stronger way than you've ever been able to, because most of you are 18 or you're going to turn 18, so you're going to vote. Someone said to me, that might be... And I was like, hang on a sec, she's just telling everyone to vote. That's not political. And they were like, no, but she's made it very clear in the past where her political allegiances lie. You know, she's been very outspoken about Trump. The royal family has historically stayed out of politics. There is an inherent conflict between a member of the British royal family involved in American politics. It just can't work. Before Meghan became pregnant with Archie, they had intended to go to America on tour. But she made it very clear that she wasn't going to see Trump. I'm afraid it doesn't work like that. Clearly she is a woman with very strong political opinions. I think we will probably see and hear more of these now that she is detached from the royal family. As well as freeing her to speak her mind, Leaving has allowed Meghan to regain control of her own agenda and to hit out directly at her detractors. Meghan has always liked to control her own publicity. Through her Instagram, very popular Instagram account, and her blog, The Tig, she was used to being able to control the message. I think it's when things have been out of control, that's what she finds frustrating. Believe in what makes you unique and don't be afraid to do what you know is right, even when it's not popular even when it's never been done before. Well, Meghan's choice of language of even when it's not popular, even if it's not been done before, was definitely a pointed reference to their decision to leave the royal family. Even if it scares people, and even if it scares you. That age-old mantra, which has stood the royals in very good stead, never complain, never explain. I think most people would say that she absolutely didn't understand that. One of the things she felt very stifled by was not being able to answer back. I think Meghan's biggest problem has been that she's obviously been schooled in, in the world of Hollywood where you hit back at, at rumours and innuendo and you take the fight to them. Meghan couldn't grasp the reason why she wasn't able to respond to these. Well, there was so much more at stake than just Meghan Markle. The whole House of Windsor needed to be considered in whether or not she was to respond to an allegation that was levelled against her. And that narrow-mindedness 
goes a long way to explaining why her and Harry would ultimately leave the family. And I think this book is largely being written to put her side of the story across. And regardless of their personal influence on the book, it hasn't been the only outlet for the couple's grievances. Harry and Meghan take on the tabloids. She is suing a newspaper for publishing a private letter to her father. The letter related to Thomas Markle's various dealings with the media, following his non-appearances at the couple's wedding in May 2018. And within the court documents, some of Meghan's complaints about her treatment within the House of Windsor have been laid bare. She has used the courts as a forum to get her version of events out into the public. Meghan's detractors say she's attempting to manipulate the media and claim the revelations in her court evidence and writing the letter to her father in the first place are evidence of this. If Meghan expects me or anybody else that I know who has a brain to think that she wrote that letter for anything except damaging her father's reputation and boosting her own and excusing her, she better think again. The central point of the case is whether Meghan wrote this letter with the intention of it being public. And one of the authors behind this book has actually gone on record to say that Meghan wrote it with the public in mind. That was a comment made by author Omid Scobie earlier in the year, but not repeated in the book. Meghan emphatically states that she didn't expect the contents to become public. But Associated Newspapers, publishers of The Mail on Sunday, are contesting that. Before being published, the letter had been referred to in People magazine. She may have given her friends permission to speak to People magazine. Friends have been spoken to at some point, but I genuinely think that that was a letter between herself and her father, and I don't think she wanted it to be in any of the papers. She would have been very frustrated that, that it was uh, published without her knowledge. It will be up for the courts to decide of whether this was an issue or whether she did know or didn't. I think it must be very sad and exhausting for Harry and Meghan to have had to undertake this court action. They're forced to go through this vicious cycle of seeing more lies and the same lies come up and people buy into it and people dig into it. So it has to be exhausting for them, but I have to say, it is the right thing to do. Since beginning the court proceedings, both Harry and Meghan have been accused of hypocrisy in their dealings with the media. Whether or not she wanted the letter leaked is really unknown at this point. But what I can say with certainty is that she does want certain stories leaked. In the book, Finding Freedom, it says that she worked with the paparazzi. She tipped them off and she tipped off local journalists because she was trying to further her own profile. And you do kind of come away from the book thinking, Harry and Meghan are perfectly happy to invade their own privacy as long as it's a positive outcome for them. I've never seen a member of the royal family who has polarised opinion quite as strongly as Meghan and then Harry and Meghan. It's almost as if people took positions very, very early on. You're either for them or you're against them. But unlike many such debates, there will eventually be winners and losers on at least some of the big questions over Meghan. Is she an attention-seeking hypocrite who was a disruptive influence on the royal family? Or is she a well-meaning and wholly innocent victim of racism, sexism and the machinery and machinations of the monarchy? It seems that the English courts will play a part in answering that question. If they are to win, they will have won at the expense of dragging the royal family through the month. So win or lose, in my view, it's a loss. Released from the House of Windsor, have Harry and Meghan really found their freedom? If it was not for COVID-19, we would have seen and heard a lot more from this couple. They are holed up, 
in a rented 80 million pound mansion. They really need to try and take a, a bit of time out and maybe realise what they want, what their future looks like. Meghan and Harry have begun their new journey in Los Angeles and released from the shackles of the British monarchy, their new life is laid bare in a revelatory new book, Finding Freedom. But are they? I think moving to LA, to California, they have found a lot of freedom, at least a lot compared to what they were having over here in the UK. It's just different over there. It's more laid back, it's easier, it's a slower pace of life. And I think that's going to be good for the both of them. They really need to try and take a bit of time out and maybe realize what they want, what their future looks like. They're not in the public eye as much as they were over here. So I think they've got a real opportunity to slow down, to figure it out and to find happiness. But if finding freedom is their goal, 2020 hasn't been the easiest year in which to achieve it. Have they actually found freedom? Not really. No one could have predicted this pandemic, but the reality is that they are holed up in a rented 80 million pound mansion in Beverly Hills, taking on the paparazzi because they believe they have invaded their privacy by taking pictures of them. The idea that they are almost prisoners in their own home doesn't suggest that they have found freedom. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex launched another legal action, this time in the US, after drones were allegedly used to take pictures of their infant son, Archie. These reports of the drone that's flying over their LA home and, and they're trying to find that person and then they will sue that person, it goes to show you that they will not put up with the invasion of their privacy at all. Some believe that for a couple seeking freedom and wary of the paparazzi, moving to Los Angeles was a strange choice. That remains the great paradox of a decision to move out of the royal family to avoid the limelight and move to a place where the limelight shines brighter than anywhere else in the world. They've gone to the pap capital of the world. In LA, freedom of expression is paramount. I think that we're seeing how they're trying to achieve the privacy that they want by suing publications, and they probably won't stop until they stop being pursued. So I think this will definitely put caution in a lot of journalists and a lot of photographers and being very, very careful about what they print. The Sussexes' battle is far from over when it comes to protecting their privacy. But what does the future hold when it comes to their financial freedom? I think we're going to see a lot more of Meghan and Harry making speeches. I've been told the Obama's business model is something that they're very much aspiring to, which could earn them a very lucrative income indeed. I mean, public speak engagements alone could earn a couple of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm quite sure that in California, where they're now based, that there will be all kinds of companies that will want to see them on their boards. And I can well imagine for example, Megan going on board of a major, major international company to look at um, gender issues. There's much speculation about the path that Meghan will take. But what about Prince Harry? The break from the royal family meant giving up all his military titles, and which took up an awful lot of his time. I think he probably took that quite hard, and I think that was a bit harsh, but I'm hoping that he can continue to work with veterans in some form, perhaps in America, and continue that line of work, because he was genuinely passionate about it. If, as seems likely, Harry has more difficulty than Meghan in acclimatising to this new life, might some kind of return to the royal fold be possible? The Queen gave them this option of the trial period, you know, see how you fare after 12 months and see if it's working for you. Partly through coronavirus and partly through the way they have handled things, what they hoped to achieve is clearly turning out to be more of an uphill struggle than they would have envisaged initially. Who knows? I don't think they know what they're going to be doing between now and next week, much less next year. 
there were headlines in some of the tabloid press after the serialization that you know there was no way back after this after the revelations after airing their dirty laundry in public that you know this was it for the sussexes i'm not so sure while i don't think they will go back to a royal role as such harry remains in spite of what's been said and what's happened deeply loved um, by his family Whatever the future might hold for the former royal couple, it seems that for now, a return to the House of Windsor is very far from their minds. I think that they will get it right over there. You know, I have hope that they will do exciting and amazing things together, uh, become financially independent and live a peaceful life, which I suspect is what they both want. I applaud Harry and Meghan for standing up for what they believe and wanting to carve out a life for themselves that makes them happy. That should ultimately be what we all want for them. They've got an opportunity to make a change, to make a difference, and, and I'm quite sure that they will continue to do that over the next few years, but not under the umbrella of the royal family, but under their own umbrella. In 2018, William, Harry, Kate and Meghan were being hailed as the golden generation who'd build a new 21st century monarchy. In just two years, that dream has shattered. How? Finding freedom certainly doesn't have all the answers, but it does reveal the open wounds currently blighting the royal family, and some say rubs salt into them. There are two sides to every story. Which one to believe? That's up to you.
Did Meghan really know what she was letting herself in for when she married into the royal family? Some stories show how she struggled to get to grips with royal life, like her first official engagement with the Queen, opening the Mersey Gateway Bridge in June 2018. People haven't looked at the, at the real person who's trying to do her best coming into the royal family. Someone who didn't know the protocol, didn't know the etiquette. I'll give you a perfect example. She went up to Liverpool with the Queen and she's sitting on a stage. It's a windy day. She doesn't know what side of the car to get into, to get out of. What hand to hold her handbag in. And you can see that kind of confusion in her face. Megan, even though she's an actress, has had to swap the, the red carpet for, the, you know, the, the, the Royal Roadshow. And it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult gig. There were certain elements of royalty that perhaps weren't for Megan, but she was widely condemned regardless, like security. <laughs> Dylan Howard's Royals at War reminds us of an incident in Fiji when Meghan visited a market. Every royal is assigned a level of protection when making 